management came out, no competition, the world, uh, we're absolutely sure it had all the answers and not terribly receptive. Uh, but at least if you published and published and published and published and published and uh, young people read it and it was used in classrooms, you get known and these things became known. Whether they had much impact, I have my doubts. Uh, but Joe's great weakness in my eyes, and uh, he knows that because I told him that 40 odd years ago, was that he thought publishing first. I don't think he probably enjoys uh, writing or public speaking. Uh, but also he, uh, I think believes profoundly that uh, uh, deeds will make themselves known. Well, yes, I think so, provided somebody does blow the trumpet, somebody does write the headline. Uh, and I think in that sense, he has, I think, been mm, not as responsible to his own ideas. One has a responsibility to make oneself effective, I believe. And I think that would be my one criticism of this wonderful human being that his self-effacement has deprived not him of it hasn't deprived him of effectiveness because he has been incredibly effective, but it has deprived his ideas of their full impact, uh, of their uh, ability to stimulate thinking, to uh, create controversy and consensus. Uh, maybe this is simply a matter of timing. Maybe it simply means that instead of things becoming, of his ideas becoming known uh, in the 60s and 70s, we have to wait to the 90s and next century, I hope so. But I think that uh, uh, one owes a responsibility to make oneself effective and ideas need to become known. May I call upon your powers as a trained journalist to help uh, us set the record straight about what happened in Japan with Dr. Jury? What happened while there? In Japan, in the 50s. Uh, <sighs> this is not to diminish what you, your role, no, or no. to diminish no. Dr. Jennings' role. What Look. should America know about what Dr. Duran did in Japan? I think that one of the areas of real ignorance in this country is uh, to understand Japan. One has to understand two things, namely that practically everything that we consider Japanese management is not Japanese at all, very little. Practically all of it is Japanese adaptation and improvement, considerable improvement, on things they learned from us. The great strength of the Japanese has been through, that's a history, uh, where they for centuries kind of felt that uh, all learning comes from China, uh, has been that willingness to be receptive and then to transmute what comes from the outside and make it fit their hand. And uh, they came out of World War II. They dis I, don't, I think it is almost impossible to realize how fragile that society was, how close to the abyss of social uh, disintegration it was. The old leadership was totally discredited, not just purged. Uh, the new people had, all they knew was that 
the things they had grown up in no longer worked. And they were desperate uh, and receptive. Uh, and the American industry and American management were clearly the examples. Uh, And so, so they, they reached <coughs> and they brought, I think they started actually during the occupation, the early beginnings, there's some literature on it, those people are people like Pokenhorn or what have you, almost totally forgotten, who first in the occupation started to work with Japanese industry. But after the occupation was gone, or at the time when Japanese management had, was really taking over again, and Japanese government, uh, they organized systematically, bringing in uh, mm, as all of, all of us were Americans. Most of us we had no effect, partly because we somehow didn't resonate and partly because we just told the Japanese things that uh, they had learned didn't work. And the few, and basically, I wouldn't say only three of us, but basically the Japanese will tell you, the three who gave Japanese the concepts and the tools and trained people, uh, now, Deming spent a great deal of time in Japan, far more than any of us. I went over for three weeks every other year, or six weeks, three weeks. Uh, Joe, Joran, I think, had no such fixed schedule, but he was there a good deal. Uh, and ran, uh, uh, those people who where our students and I think all retired by now. A good many of them are no longer there because they were older than we were mostly. Uh, uh, but uh, they immediately acted on it because they were desperate for policies and practices. Give you just one example. Uh, in one seminar we talked of innovation. This must have been 1959. And I said, one does not go out of an old product gradually. One cuts. And I noticed one of the men got up and left. And at lunch, I sat next to him and I said to him, Takeuchi, oh, he didn't come back. What happened? They said, I had to call my uh, company. And in those days, we were in the mountains, telephone service wasn't that good. I said, what? They said, last week at the board meeting, we decided to phase out rayon over three years and bring in synthetics. I listened to you and went out and called and said, we stop making rayon tomorrow. That, that's a very typical story. I made sense to him. He did not, just because I told it. But suddenly the light went on, and he acted. And the same friend of mine who built NEC into the one of the largest electronics and computer and telecommunications companies, acted on a Duran seminar. And he told it to me. His name is Kobayashi. He is 87 and retired. He was, he ran a division. I don't know what he acted on. But he also said, I left that seminar, and next day we did it. Uh, now, you, you could do it because the Jap there was no resistance. The Japanese knew that what they were doing didn't work. They were desperate. Uh, and in that atmosphere, uh, and a good many things they 
phone didn't work, they gave them up. But the things that worked, they developed them and went to work. Uh, what is it that, that, that Joe Joran contributed to Japan? Let me see. He contributed probably more than any specific practice. The uh, realization that manufacturing is a process and has to be organized and managed as a process. Uh, and secondly, that it has to be managed from the bottom up and not just from the top down. Uh, that all three of us, Joran and Deming and I, preached and preached and preached and preached. We have learned that in World War II. And in this country, it was immediately forgotten, but largely because of pressure from Washington. One of the things people don't realize that uh, I worked very closely with General Motors in those days. And when we, for instance, tried to get some of these things we had learned during World War II about managing a plant, we got orders from Washington, from Mr. Truman, who said, the people who are coming back from service have to be productive. We were desperately afraid of a post-war depression. They have to be able to produce tomorrow. Truman was no fool. In fact, you know, next November, I hope I can vote for him again. Uh, it's the only president I really enjoyed voting for. Uh, and... Uh, Let me get this for just one moment. Um, and so... Uh, You said something wonderful about Dr. Duran in your letter. <coughs> you called him actually, he, you said he fathered and nurtured modern manufacturing management. Yes. Which is a very strong statement. What, what did you, you know, what moved you to, to make that, that claim for Dr. Duran? Well, look, that all the thing, first, if you, we are now talking about lean manufacturing to Joe didn't use such terms. In fact, I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever heard Joe use slogans. Uh, but he talked basically about a manufacturing that was be built to make the human strength productive, and in which the industrial engineer and don't forget he is one himself and a good one is the support to the workforce, which was. We had learned that in World War II we had, because we had no choice, but it was heretical. And the meeting, by the way, terribly unpopular in academia, uh, uh, in the industrial engineering, uh, academicians uh, didn't like somebody who said, uh, we are not, you are not the bosses, uh, you are not omnipotent. Uh, he, and I'm sure he didn't use his words, they didn't exist, uh, he, but he was the first to see uh, the, uh, to look at manufacturing from the output back. And when you talk, all these people are gone to Toyota, uh, you know, the just-in-time system, which was not something Toyota went into because they wanted to, but because the total absence of any working transportation system in Japan forced them to. Uh, uh, but this was largely made possible by Joran concepts in looking at the plant from what goes out the door instead of what comes in. And then you can organize the plant as a flow. And then you can have just in time. And the reason why just in time in this country s still doesn't work is that they still try to put it on top of a system that begins where we are and we don't know where we're coming out. That's not the way to do it. And Joe knew that I'm, no, I'm quite sure he didn't use those words. They didn't exist. Uh, 
and the basic concept that you don't start with putting in machines, you start with looking at the work process, uh, which then let the man who really built Toyota was a manufacturer man who came to this country, had come to this country in the late 40s, had looked at GM and was not happy. But he didn't know what else to do. And it was a Duran concept of uh, uh, that you start with engineering the work, not engineering the machines and not engineering the materials flow. That led to the Toyota production method, which uh, was still beating us hollow. And, you know, we still haven't learned it. GM wouldn't be in the pickle it's in if it hadn't poured $40 billion into automation before without analyzing the work process, which is just wasting $40 billion. That's why GM is in trouble today. And those are the kind of things which Joe preached. And Joe's strength was these fundamental concepts, the way of, I call it perceiving, and then adapting it to the specific process. Uh, which is always a total process. At Deming, by contrast, looks at one uh, factor. All three of us knew, because we had learned in World War II, that quality doesn't cost, and that the accounting model is a snare and a delusion because it hides the costs of not doing, which are 70%. Yes, in 70% of the cost, the actual cost is poor quality, where you scrap the stuff or have to rework it, and machine downtime. Those are the expensive things. Doing things is cheap. Not doing things is expensive. They cost 100%. And, co and cost accounting does not measure these. This is, was my contribution to both Deming and Joran, neither of whom has a financial background that I do. And this is what I think I taught the two of them. Uh, but we all shared, we all knew it. I just gave them the analytical concepts. Uh, it's now, the new accounting is now coming in 40 years later. Which is normal. Will you accept the fact that don't complain about the time lag? New ideas need 40 years before the old paradigm goes out. We know, we know that now. It's perfectly normal. Uh, but Joe knew it and I knew it. We didn't have the analytical tools that come in now, but we had the concepts. Uh, and Deming started out with this and therefore built it around quality. And, uh, and uh, let me see, Ed Deming never understood that the same approach also gives you productivity. Ed is only now beginning to talk productivity. Joe always talked productivity. He understood it from the beginning. Uh, and so did I. Uh, but uh, Deming's great strength is that narrow focus. That's an enormous strength because you get immediate improvements very fast, which has great power of conviction, uh, or changes the whole atmosphere and the whole view. Uh, that's, don't underrate it. Uh, but, uh, but Joe had this concept, Joe, well, it had quality also in the center. It was the center of a system, which then I means it's everything. Uh, uh, and so the Japanese concepts are based, uh, people talk about consensus decisions as if they were a Japanese invention. That's what I taught them. I taught them that one first think through what the decision is all about and build, making it effective anything ringing. 
Yeah, let's wait a second. Yes. I don't know which one. That's my telephone. If the answer machine will come up in a second. You don't hear it here. Now it should.